in this video we're going to be building a gaming PC for around £100 with parts we bought from eBay. Let's have a look at what we got. We've got this uh, SanDisk 64 gig SSD drive which was £11.94. This will be the main boot drive for Windows and because it's not really big enough to put games on then we also need a secondary storage drive this 500 gig hard drive you can buy something like this for around £9.50 including postage or less if you go for a laptop version but the laptop drives are going to be slower here we have a pallet GTX 460 you can pick these up for around £30 and also CEX sell these for around £30 and we have a Corsair VS450 450 watt power supply you can get these for around £24 and although I maybe wouldn't necessarily recommend this exact power supply um, I would say stick with a branded power supply this one is has got the kind of connections we need for the graphics card and when you're looking at graphics cards you need to be aware of what kind of power connectors they have because this has specific requirements in terms of the power supply needed. This one will work with a 450 watt power supply but if you went for a better graphics card, a newer model or a different version then you need to look at the power supply requirements because um, that will also push up the budget you need to spend on a power supply and where we've probably saved the most money is in the purchase of this motherboard here which is an Asus P5G41M it's got built-in graphics it's got VGA and HDMI and this one comes with 4 gigabytes of DDR2 memory and a Core 2 Duo 2.7 gigahertz processor and what we've managed to get here is quite a good deal because this was £20 including the heatsink as well and it comes with this PCI Express slot which we need for the graphics card it's also got expansion ports you can add IDE, SATA and if we had a higher budget we could spend another £10 and would be able to look at getting a quad core processor but because of the limited budget of £100 all in we went for this one there's only £1 more than the mini ITX system but comes with twice as much memory it's a better board lots more upgrade potential and yeah let's start putting this together We're using the uh, same case from the last build, which is a free case from um, Facebook. And we're using the same optical drive as the last build, which was just under £5. But if you wanted to save money um, and needed spare SATA cables, then you could skip the optical drive and just build it without. This motherboard has a um, little diagram here telling you where you need to connect the um, front panel connectors, the reset switch, the LEDs, etc. So this is what we can do. It's just here, next to these pins. You 
the speaker connection is all the way back here. And the power LED connection is the wrong size for this bit, so we'll just leave that off. Installing the graphics card. This clicks into this PCI Express slot and this tab holds it in place. Takes up two slots and be careful about cables that it might squash depending on how big the card is and the layout of the motherboard. And then we use a couple of screws or one screw there to hold it in. A magnetic screwdriver is very handy in case you drop screws just like that. Because then you can pick them up. Very important next step is to connect the PCIe power connections. These are six pin connections, some have eight pin, and you need to be careful when choosing a power supply that your power supply has the right connections, otherwise, you're going to end up having to spend more money to get an adapter cable. So we have connected the power supply to the motherboard, main cable here, the CPU connection here, we've connected up the power for the graphics card, we've connected up the power for the two drives, SSD here and hard drive here, we've connected the power for the optical drive, and we've connected all the SATA cables to the motherboard down here. We've connected up the front panel so that the switches and the LEDs on the case work, connect up the speaker as well as the front USB and front audio connections. And I think we are ready to connect it all up, switch it on and see if it works. Okay I'm going to switch on the power switch at the back of the power supply. The LED has lit up on the motherboard and I'm going to press the power button. Okay, we're going to press delete and hopefully we did it in time to get into the motherboard. And we've got the SanDisk SSD drive, we've got the hard drive, we've got the optical drive. That's going to system information. We've got a dual core E5400, 2.7 gigahertz. We've got 4 gig of RAM. And we're going to go into have a look at the hardware monitor see the CPU temperature 24 degrees motherboard temperature 23 fan speed CPU Q fan control let's enable that and that should maybe make the processor CPU fan cooler or quieter rather silent mode so it's quite loud not sure if it's the power supply, the CPU, or the graphics card at the moment, but main thing is that it's working and everything looks okay in here. We've got the SSD as the first boot device. And this motherboard's quite neat because you've got jumper-free configuration, auto overclocking, different options. 
Lots of information here. And let's just leave and boot into Windows. We ended up with a Windows update slowing us down there. So we need to connect to the internet using a USB dongle and we need to let the system find the drivers for the new graphics card. And I also need to plug in the mouse. That would definitely help. As before we can use core temp to check the temperature of the system, make sure it's happy and I think it is the processor fan that's quite loud so I might swap that out for a different one. You can use CPU-Z to check the general system information, check the performance we're getting. So this is a slightly slower processor than the one in the last system. Um, but we've got 4 gigabytes of RAM running in dual channel. So we're getting what, 430, we're getting 500 with the other processor. So that's as a percentage, I don't know, quite a bit slower, a little bit. So yeah, getting a better processor could be a good option if available. Um, going forward I might swap in a better processor into this system. But for now, let's see what we can you know, do with this system once we've let Windows update the drivers. I went to um, remove this heatsink um, with, I think, the loud fan. And it's still got an original application of um, thermal paste. And it's pretty terrible. Um, there's gaps in it, which is what you definitely do not want. So um, it's a good job I took this off. as this would probably not have cooled very well, cooled this CPU very well. So we're going to remove this, reapply thermal paste and use the heat sink from the other system. Okay, we've replaced the power heat sink and thermal paste. So obviously the first thing we're going to do is go into the BIOS and check the temperature. And one thing we've forgotten to do, as you can obviously see, is reconnect the power for the graphics card. So it's obviously not switched on. We've also not reconnected the power for the um, processor so we need to switch it off reconnect those things and hopefully we haven't damaged anything switching it off at the power In hardware monitor we've got a reasonable temperature, CPU 26, motherboard 26. Let's um, enable that, go for silent, CPU fan profile, let's see if that makes any difference. could hear it just then, the speed of this processor fan slowed down, making it a quieter system. And we're in Windows. Almost.
In the last video we were talking about Crystal Disk Info and how you can use it to tell you the health of your drive. So the SSD drive is, you know, good, 94%. The hard disk drive has a caution health status warning. So uncorrectable sector count one. Current pending sector count one. That's maybe not anything too serious, but this is one of the reasons why you don't necessarily want to buy second-hand hard drives. You don't know how they've been treated, how much of, you know this has been used. 273 days. So maybe, maybe a good idea not to trust this with important things. This is to show you the speed difference between the SSD drive here and the hard disk drive here. This isn't the fastest SSD drive available but um, as you can see it's maybe twice as quick for read speeds and only a little bit quicker for write speeds here but what's interesting here is the random read and write speeds this is say 20 times faster or 10 times faster than the hard disk drive so generally the performance is going to be quicker for Windows and um, yeah, an SSD is a good idea for the boot drive, the main drive, and anything you need to load quickly. And if we'd bought a better um, SSD drive, we should be getting, you know, 240 megabytes a second write speeds. And then if we use this drive on a newer system with SATA 3, then we should also get better speeds again. Whereas um, hard disk drive is always going to have slow speeds for these things here and get slower the more you fill the drive up can we play roblox roblox yes we can oh look and it looks quite a bit better than the last time we tried it let's try another game let's try minecraft Ooh. Is it downloading or is it doing something else? It's CPUing. That's quite slow. Try this. Let's try fast graphics. Okay, that's a bit better. Okay, so it says we're getting about 50 to 80, 94 frames per second. It's pretty good. This should make it 
eminently playable at that sort of speed. But I mean, not much is happening. But let's uh, do some of this. Frame rate drops right down, and I'll get rid of this. But yeah, 1,768. It's reasonably playable. Only a little bit of slowdown. And yes, it will play Minecraft. A bee! Beehive! Ah! Bees! <laughs> Bees being attacked by bees. Get off. Oh, Bobby. Will it play League of Legends? Yes, I don't know how to play, but it's running this at medium settings at 1680 by 1050, and it's getting 150 frames per second. So that's good. Will it play Rocket League? And the answer is yes, it's at 1680 by 1050 and high quality settings and we're getting, I don't know, 50 frames per second? 60 frames per second? Minimum 26 frames per second? That's better than I was expecting. CSGO, so 1024 by 768, turn down some of the settings to medium, getting a maybe or an average of 30 frames per second, depending how busy the scene is, down to 20 frames per second, I think with some more tweaking of the settings we could probably um, Improve the frames for a second. Ooh, 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 they're all getting shot. We're in Fortnite. And we've got performance mode on. It's 1280 by 800. 75% resolution. Getting about over 60 frames a second. I don't know how to play this game. Still getting the um, random freezes. Try it and land far from enemy players. Random freeze. This is 3D Mark 2005, an old benchmark uh, tool for testing your system performance and graphics card performance. Getting around 40 to 60 frames per second here, which is pretty good. Um, the last system, I didn't show it on the video, but we were getting about, you know, 5 to 10 frames per second. So, a dedicated graphics card is giving us a definite improvement. We've also got four gigs of RAM and um, we can play Minecraft. Uh, we're probably going to struggle for some games which says it requires a minimum of a quad-core processor but older games the system should be fine and uh, being able to get a bundle of motherboard, CPU, heatsink and memory is you know for £20 is quite impressive really um, yeah quite quite impressive that you can get so much for so little and um, really if we spent maybe another £10 we'd probably get a quad core processor and yeah the next you know improvement from there would be having 8 gigabytes of RAM rather than 4 gigabytes of RAM and that will definitely help with gameplay other games doing more things, more memory intensive things, but um, it's kind of a balance between spending money on a on the main system or spending money on a better graphics card or better 
power supply um, and on the subject of power supplies we've gone for this Corsair VS450 um, it's just what I saw had available um, and had the right power connectors for us but there are other options um, and it's just a case of going for a branded power supply such as Cooler Master, Seasonic, EVGA, Antec, maybe even FSP and um, if you can look for an 80 plus rating then that's a good idea because um, you can always keep the power supply and use it in a future system you know, you don't necessarily need to change or upgrade too much if you spend wisely in the first place um, the internet doesn't necessarily recommend this um, Corsair VS450 um, or the orange label Corsair VS power supplies they tend to be kind of a budget power supply but I've not really had any problems with it um, I just need to be careful not to overload it I guess